Good morning, everyone. I had to uh, do this at 11 o'clock today because I couldn't get it in earlier, sorry. Um, but I hope that's still okay. I'm uh, Bob. I'm the Teacher Virtuous Facilitator here at the Charles G. Andrew Youth and Family Treatment Center. Of course, that's where I am here today. Uh, I don't, I don't see any, uh, I don't see any bears out there. <laughs> we do get some bears around here sometimes. And uh, we've certainly had some hot weather. Uh, except in this boardroom I'm in, in right now, the multi-purpose room, it's freezing. They've had the uh, air conditioner on the whole time, so, uh, you know, it was it's kind of kind of chilly here, but that's okay. You know, it's good to be chilly on a hot day. And we got a little bit of rain today, so that's good for the garden. So I didn't water the garden very much this morning because I knew we were going to have a little bit of rain, so that's good, you know. Anyway, we're working our way through the uh, Family uh, Virtues Guide. And uh, that's simple ways to bring out the best in our children and ourselves, you know. And the best way to bring out the best in your children is to try and bring out the best in yourself. And we know that uh, is related to the virtues. Um, we've completed three, uh, three strategies already. One, number one was speaking the language of the virtues. So if you've been following my uh, live videos, of course, you know, we've gone through this speaking the language of the virtues. Number two was recognizing teachable moments. And the last one we have just completed now is set clear boundaries. Now, if you remember, I said at the end of that section, I'm going to give you some examples of uh, consequences that you could use in the event that a ground rule is broken. Now, you know, ultimately what we want is we want children to be responsible and uh, not go breaking ground rules that have been set by the family, especially when the children are involved in creating those ground rules, you know. However, if there is a ground rule and your child breaks that ground rule, or you as a parent breaks that ground rule, there are consequences that have to be uh, put into place. So I, I want to give you some examples of those, okay? Consequences for kids. One is parental disapproval. In the context of a loving parent-child relationship, parental disapproval is often the most motivating of consequences. When kids think to themselves why they should choose not to do something wrong, it's usually because their parent would disapprove. Not because they will have to go to time out, Parental disapproval does not mean shaming, however, and it's good to keep in mind the adage to criticize the behavior, not the person. Now, this one, for me in particular, when I was growing up as a, as a little boy and teenager, uh, I would not do things sometimes because I was afraid my mother would find out and she wouldn't be very happy, you know, especially when I experimented with drinking, you know, like... Uh, God help us if she ever caught me drinking or caught me drunk, especially, you know. So uh, parental disapproval certainly worked for me in that case, you know. So keep that one in mind. And, and hopefully if you develop that kind of awareness in your child and that kind of responsibility and you nurture the virtues, that they will have the respect for the parents in such a way that uh, they won't do things that they're not supposed to do, you know. Another one we've talked about before is uh, time out. Time out is a good consequence on a number of levels. It gives both of you a cooling off period and avoids escalation to pointless, angry arguments. And that gets you nowhere. It is also a form of social isolation and as such teaches that in order to participate in the social group, you must follow certain social behaviors such as not hitting your brother in the face. <laughs> and remember, time out, of course, could be just sitting on the last step of the stairs, like I've done with my grandson, grandchildren, or out sitting on your knee. Like, it's just taking them away from the activity and giving them an opportunity to cool down and, and maybe understand why they hit their brother in the face or whatever, you know? It gives you an opportunity to talk with them. Um, another one is removal of possessions, such as a toy, game, bicycle, TV. It hurts, and it's meant to give the child the time to think about their misbehavior through a feeling of loss. That's why it's important to not allow the child to simply replace that possession with something else that is pleasurable. For example, 
Well, you know, the consequence is we're turning off the TV. You're not going to get to watch the TV now for an hour. So the child goes into the room and plays their video game. Uh, that, you know, it's just replacing one with the other and, and, and they're not uh, learning that way, right? If they don't feel the loss, they don't learn the lesson. Keep that in mind. If they don't feel the loss, they don't learn the lesson. In cases of serious misbehavior that is not responding to consequences, removal of all toys and possessions may be called for. In this case, children earn back their bicycle, they earn back the TV, they earn back their video game, etc., etc., through the display of excellent behavior. Okay? So take it all away, and then they earn it back bit by bit. So that's removal of possessions. Removal of privileges is another one, another consequence you can use. You know, such as watching TV, having a friend over, going on an outing. These are privileges that they can earn, right? These are the short-term consequences that we give children when they misbehave. The common term is, that's right, grounding. Grounding is most effective when you follow the guidelines above. The child should be warned that they will be grounded if a specific behavior is repeated. It should be for a single outing or very short time period, and when it's given, you should follow through. Okay. The next one is making amends. There is a healing experience for the offender when he makes amends for his wrongdoing. Things are made right, and that is a powerful learning effect for a simple consequence. Replacing a broken or lost object. And this happens sometimes, okay? So by earning money or working it off, they can replace a broken or lost object. You know, if they lost a toy belonging to uh, their friend, or they broke something, you know, um, they can mow the lawn. Uh, depending on the age, of course, you know, um, and, and you could pay them some money for that. Um, they could take it to garbage. Maybe you paid them some money for that. Or if you um, give them allowance, let's say you give them five bucks a week, okay? But they broke somebody's toy. So you could actually buy, buy a toy and replace it, and the child would have to pay that off. So let's say the toy costs $10, and you're giving them an allowance of $5 a week. Well, maybe you give them $4, and keep a dollar back to, to pay for the toy for each week until the toy is paid for. Or you could take $2, you know, but don't take it all from them. Say, where is it? You're not getting an allowance now for the next so long, right? You know, but just take a little bit at a time and, you know, and because remember, we're trying to teach them something. We're not trying to hurt them, make them feel bad. Um... They should learn, of course, that restitution is the right thing to do. It's not punishment. It's simply the way the world works, isn't it? You know. Another one, saying I'm sorry. How many of you uh, <laughs> find it difficult to say, I'm sorry? <laughs> also related to making amends, saying I'm sorry feels like punishment to some of us. But what a valuable lesson we learn when we find forgiveness and reparation of a relationship through the words, I'm sorry. It's a matter of owning up to some of the mistakes that we make, right? Another one is confession. Even harder than saying I'm sorry, confession is more powerful because it requires us to acknowledge to ourselves and then to state to another person what we did wrong. Confession is the opposite of lying to prevent punishment, and therefore it should be rewarded. But confession doesn't erase the need to make amends or face other consequences of wrongdoing. But when a child confesses a wrongdoing, I mean, we have to acknowledge it. We have to be proud of the child for actually confessing or having done something. But if there's a consequence for it, you apply the consequence. Okay, it doesn't erase the consequence. Keep that in mind. Another one, early bedtime. A quick consequence for times when the child seems to lose control. Now, since the misbehavior may very well be related to tiredness or overstimulation, 
Early bedtime addresses this problem and gives everyone a break from a bad situation. Another one that teachers use, check marks on a card with different levels of loss of privileges. This is a tool you will see in many elementary classrooms and parents can learn a lesson from the teacher's approach. It's a graduated consequence tool that is concrete and in front of the child at all times. She knows where she is on the card system and can take steps to moderate her behavior to prevent the escalation of consequences. Hmm. Learning to control her own behavior. Now that's what discipline is all about. So the way it works is the name of the children down one side and then on top, like you can have, let's say, three columns. Okay, you know the three strikes you're out? So if a child misbehaves at something, you give her a check mark. She still has two squares. Nothing happens with the one check mark, unless it's serious enough where you go check, 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 all three. <laughs> you know, but the child says, I got a check mark. Oh my, I can't get any more. And if they get a second check mark, it's like, woo, I have to be really good now because I certainly don't want that third check mark, right? And so at the end of the day, if they don't get the third check mark, they're good. Next day, you could start over again, you know, but the child can monitor the behavior this way. And it's a, it's a great tool. And I use it in my classroom here at the Charles J. Andrew Treatment Center as well. Um, only when I'm finding that, uh, you know, his behaviors are starting to become a little bit, maybe much, then I'll put up a chart. I'll say, guys, look, here's the chart. Now, what will the consequence be? Well, it could be uh, today they're going swimming. And if they get three check marks, then they stay back and don't go swimming, you know. Or they may be going to the beach. And they know, they got to know ahead of time, okay. Now, you know, guys, if you get three check marks, you don't go to the beach today. Now keep that in mind, okay? So to get a check mark, then two more and you're not going to the beach. They really want to go to the beach. So they start to check their behavior. And as they continue to do this, it becomes practice. It becomes a routine. Um, it becomes um, something that they, they learn, something that develops inside of them, that they have to constantly monitor behavior. Eventually, you don't even need check marks. You don't need the chart up there at all because this, you know, the child becomes uh, aware of what they're doing. Now, this one here, I, I'm, I'm not happy with this one, extra chore. If you still call washing dishes a chore or sweeping the floor a chore, then okay, you could use it then as a, as a consequence. Um, you know, so you could give an extra chore if something is, is not going, you know, as, as one of the consequences for something, right? But I prefer to call it a service, you know, um, because... You don't want them to feel that washing the dishes is something they shouldn't want to do. Uh, uh, see, a chore has a negative, a negative connotation to it. So if you're calling these things a chore, then you're basically saying the children won't do it or don't want to do it, and therefore you have to force them to do it. What I would prefer is that, uh, you know, okay, so I'm going to sweep the floor. Um, maybe my child will wipe down the tables like a, as, a, as a service, right? Somebody needs to do it, and they step in and do it. Or they step in and help with the dishes. I prefer it to be a service. But if you still call it a chore in your house, by all means, you can uh, continue to use that as a consequence. Okay. So those are some examples of uh, consequences that you can give in the event that um, a ground rule that you have created with your family is broken. Okay, now you can add to that. There can be other, you know, if you do some research on uh, Google, for example, you might be able to come up with some other types of consequences. You may have some yourself already, you know. So I hope that's helpful to you. Now, the virtue that I selected today, and I just opened the book randomly and I said, we're going just to just go pick random today, okay? And the one that popped out was thankfulness. I said, well, that's the one we're going to do today. We're going to do thankfulness. And I think we can all use that virtue today, I'm sure, you know. So we're going to read the quote first. The quote comes from the Koran. What is to come 
is better for you than what has gone before, for your Lord will certainly give you and you will be content. Keep recounting the favors of your Lord. Now, what is thankfulness? Thankfulness is being grateful for what you have already. It is an attitude of gratitude for learning, loving, and being. Thankfulness is being glad for the special things which come along. It is also being grateful for the little things which happen around you and within you every day. It is an openness and willingness to receive each of God's bounties. To be thankful is to have a sense of wonder about the beauty of this world and to welcome all of life as a gift. Thankfulness is a path to contentment. Thankfulness is a way to get perspective when things don't look good and you start to lose hope. It is a way to grow when painful things happen. By looking at the gifts which are always there, even when they seem hidden. So why should we practice the virtue of thankfulness? Well, without thankfulness, people would stay focused on negativity. That's a problem. Without thankfulness, people would stay focused on negativ negativity, and that brings you down. They would do nothing but whine and complain. They would miss the beauty of life and the power of learning, especially during difficult times. No matter how difficult or dark things become, there is always light. There is something to learn in every painful situation. In fact, sometimes when you look back at a really hard test in your life and realize what you learned, that is when you feel the most grateful of all. When you open your heart by giving thanks to the Creator, you create more room for the flow of good things to come. Thankfulness leads to optimism. And when you expect the best, you often find it. Amazing. So how do you practice thankfulness? You practice thankfulness by noticing the beauty around you and within you. Then let yourself feel the gratitude in your heart. It takes effort right, to, to actually think about the, uh, the things that you can be thankful for in, in this world, right? Count your blessings often, especially when you're having a hard time. Find the lessons in all things, for they are the true gifts of this life. Avoid envy, because it can destroy your trust. The moment you envy someone else, you're rejecting the gifts that are yours. If you want to practice thankfulness, learn to receive. It is blessed to give, and it is blessed to receive. Everyone needs to have the opportunity to give, including the people who, are, who care for you. Be optimistic by being receptive to the life, rather than allowing fear or worry to control you. To practice thankfulness, appreciate little things. A flower by the road. The star at night. Did you see the shooting stars last night? <laughs> a challenge you met. A laugh with a friend. A sorrow shared. To be truly thankful, don't wait for a dream to be fulfilled. Celebrate the moment. What are the signs of success that we have been practicing thankfulness? Well, Congratulations, you are practicing thankfulness when you have an attitude of gratitude, when you are receptive to gifts, when you appreciate your own abilities instead of envying others. You are practicing thankfulness when you see the difficulties of your life as opportunities to learn, when you expect the best, when you appreciate the beauty of this earth, you are practicing thankfulness when you count your blessings every day and when you offer thanks to the Creator. So here's an affirmation. Write it out and stick it on your fridge for the whole week and read it every day. 
I am thankful for the many gifts within me and around me today. I celebrate each moment by opening myself to beauty and to learning. I expect the best. That's the virtue of thankfulness. Now, I have uh, some quotes here, some good ones. <laughs> quotes for the virtue of thankfulness. Every morning, and this is by Thick Han. Thick Han? I don't think it's Thick Han, but that's the name. Thick H-A-N. Han. Every morning when we wake up, we have 24 brand new hours to live. What a precious gift. Normal day, let me be aware of the treasure you are. That's Mary Jean Iron. We receive more than we can ever give. By Sir Thomas More. And Peggy Jenkins says, The more we give, the more will come to us. The more we give, the more will come to us. Now, Today, well, let's do this one first, right here. It says, look around the room, now, <laughs> depending on where you are, right? <laughs> look around the room, and when you come to someone, ask them this. What are you grateful for? Then that person asks the same question to another person, and then another person, okay? Until you go around the room. Now, this is in your family, you know, like the children can be involved and... You know, whoever, whoever is there. Each time someone is asked a question, he or she needs to give a new answer. So if I were to say, well, I'm grateful for my grandchildren. Well, the next person can't say that. They have to say something different, okay? So today, write three things for which you are grateful. Or think of three things right now that you are grateful for. That shouldn't take long. Finished? Okay. Um, what things in your life are you most thankful for? That's a similar kind of thing there, right? And um, here's one that's a, a new one. See if you can get this one. What are you most thankful for about yourself? What are you most thankful for about yourself? And the last one. Describe a difficult time in your life and name the lesson or virtue you learned from it. Describe a difficult time in your life and name the lesson or virtue you learned from it. So um, these are for discussion in your families. Be surprised at what you can come up with, okay? And I'm going to finish with a quote on joy. Joy does not simply happen to us. We have to choose joy and keep choosing it every day. Okay. Well, thank you very much for joining me. I'm uh, happy to see that uh, uh, you are taking part. Uh, I'll be back again uh, probably Friday at 11, as far as I can tell right now. But if there's any change, I'll make sure I, uh, I post it. Okay, but right now you can look forward to this at 11 o'clock on Friday unless there's a uh, posted change, okay? So until then, uh, stay safe. Stay away from the viruses. Stay cool in this heat. Drink lots of water. And if you have a swimming pool, go for a swim. <laughs> and... Uh, so un until Friday, uh, take care, and we'll talk to you then. Bye for now.